Dr. Emily Rinch. And uh, so we uh, will uh, he be hearing from her on magnesium plasmonics. And so just very briefly, uh, Dr. Rinch uh, actually started her bachelor's in chemistry at McGill University um, about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and then she finished it in a joint bachelor's and master's at Northwestern uh, University in the US where she did a bachelor's master's and then moved on to the PhD with uh, Professor uh, Rick Van Dyne and Lawrence Mark. Uh, she finished her PhD in 2012 and then uh, moved on as a research fellow at Trinity Hall uh, Cambridge uh, for about one and a half years. And then she moved to um, take a, a assistant professor position at Rice uh, University in the US in uh, Houston. Uh, she stayed there for about four years and then moved back uh, to Cambridge in 2018, where she is now a lecturer in multi-scale, multi-dimensional imaging in, of natural and synthetic materials uh, in material science and metallurgy at uh, the Department of Earth and Science, Earth Sciences at Cambridge. Um, she has authored a, a high number of publications. A lot of them are highly cited. Um, uh, they uh, range from material science, plasmonics, energy, um, fundamental to applied. So there is a very large breadth um, of expertise uh, coming from her research. And uh, we will be hearing more from her um, at this moment. So um, uh, it's a pleasure to host uh, Dr. Rinch today and uh, we're looking forward to, um, to our seminar. If you have any questions, please uh, use the chat and I will be moderating the questions uh, throughout uh, the seminar or after the seminar. Okay, thank you very much. So please, uh, we can start. All right, uh, well, thanks Jean-Francois. It's always a pleasure to, um, to be introduced so generously. Um, so, so today I wanna tell you um, a little bit about the, the, the kind of thing my group has been doing really quite recently. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about really is um, is sort of in the in the last two to three years uh, since I, I, I made the jump back uh, to uh, to the University of Cambridge. Um, before I start and before I forget, I want to thank everyone that's actually done the work. Um, I've been really lucky that as soon as I started in Cambridge, I received a big grant from the European Research Council uh, so I was up and running really, really quickly and managed to hire some wonderful people, including Jeremy Asselin here. He's one of our, uh, our Quebecois. He's been doing wonderful in Cambridge. Uh, by the way, he's going to be thinking of coming back to Canada one day, so watch out. Um, and and, and um, today I'm going to be presenting some of his work, uh, quite a bit of work from Christina here in the yellow sweater and also from Elizabeth. And I have uh, wonderful collaborators. Uh, in England, uh, such as Son, Quentin, and, and, and John. Um, and, and I call my group the Optical Nanomaterials Group. Uh, kind of funnily in England, you're not supposed to call your group your last name, which you kind of do in, in America, so I had to, to come up with the name, and here you go, Optical Nanomaterials. We do all sorts of things. Um, ever since I've, I've become independent, I've you know, managed to do, as, as Jean-François was saying, quite a breadth of things. Uh, we do quite a lot of, of instrument development, mostly optical uh, spectroscopy tool, hyperspectral tools to do things more quickly, more efficiently uh, with more data, essentially. Uh, we've been working with uh, 2D optoelectronics. That's really because I joined RICE and, and working on 2D materials at RICE is, is basically contagious. And, um, and I got funding for that. I got collaborators and, and got kind of um, um, uh, entertained uh, in that uh, quite a bit, received money on that. So worked on this. Today, I'm going to talk mostly about the plasmonic stuff uh, we're doing. This has really been our bread and butter um, ever, since, um, well, ever since I started my PhD. Um, but also I'd like to, to bring your attention to something sort of fun and useful that, that we're doing and that we receive quite a lot of funding now in England to do is that we develop kits uh, for informal teaching of scientific concept to people with visual disabilities. So it's really hands-on uh, thinking about uh, anything from light transmission to micelle formation to batteries, um, even to, to how you plot a graph. Um, and, and so on. So we publish these, these kind of kits in the Journal of Chemical Education as well on our website if you're interested in doing um, uh, small bits of outreach like that. 
so today I, I, I want to talk about, about plasmonics. I want to talk about color. Because as a society, we're just fascinated by color, right? Je, uh, Jean-Francois has, has beautiful, colorful bits of art. Pretty sure they're not Damien Hirst, um, but, but, but they are colorful, right? Um, uh, where we put color in our food, we put color on our buildings, and color can come from a variety of things, right? So it can come from an organic dye. I was actually just talking to, uh, to Jérôme about some organic dyes in, in, in the rivers in China. Well, in, in Chicago, where I did my PhD, they dyed the river green uh, on, uh, on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, it can come from a transition metal center, it can come from a semiconductor either absorption or, or emission, or it actually can come from a metal nanoparticle. And that's really wanna, what I want to talk about today. So imagine you have um, a, a particle of metal. You can think of that as basically a stiff lattice of positive ion and then a sea of electrons. Um, if you put an electric field on that, um, the electrons are going to react to this electric field and move the center of charge in that particle, the center of negative charge. If you then release the electric field, uh, the electrons are going to want to move back towards that, the center of positive charge, but they have inertia, so they overshoot and it creates a bit of a resonance that eventually damps. What you do now is that if you know that resonance frequency, the natural resonance frequency of the material, and you now excite with an oscillating electric field, i.e. light, uh, you can get then, you, you can then get huge enhancement in this resonance and, and you get an amplification of the electric field at the surface of the particle, as well as greatly enhanced light absorption and light scattering. Um, and that creates color, right? This is wavelength dependent absorption and scattering. It creates color in the far field. Uh, in the near field, what I'm gonna talk about it when I say near field is really this, this near field enhancement of the electric field. Um, the properties that happen both in the near field and the far field depend on absolutely everything, okay? It depends on, on what the particles made of, the electron density. Um, it depends on the size of the particle, it depends on the shape of the particle, it depends on the surrounding environment, it depends on the assembly. And, and uh, on, on, on kind of on one hand, that's great because it gives us a lot of knobs to turn when we think about plasmonic materials. We can really control by a lot of things. On the other hand, um, well, it really means that since everything matters, everything must be controlled. So it, it tends to be a, a really complex problem uh, to find uh, the properties of such materials. Uh, nevertheless, uh, people are, are very interested in plasmonic. They've been for, for centuries. Um, they create color. That's how uh, lots of the uh, stained glass has been made in, in the medieval times. Um, but, but Perhaps more importantly, at least, I think more importantly, these resonance don't just create color. They actually allow you to manipulate the electric field in regions that are sub-wavelength in size. It's basically a confinement effect, uh, for instance, at the corner of a triangle or between a gap between two particles and so on. This enhanced electric field gives rise to things like surface enhanced spectroscopy, such as surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And that's really useful for, for doing sensing and also for enhancing um, chemistry with those fields. Um, very recently, there's been a lot of push for doing chemistry actually with the decay product of this resonance. When the resonance goes, go, uh, decays, it creates um, non-thermally equilibrated electron and hole. Some people call them hot electrons, okay? Um, and, and then it turns into uh, basically heat. Uh, this is all a way to harvest a photon, turn it into another mechanism that can give energy to a chemical reaction and give rise um, to, to enhance um, uh, reaction rates, for instance. There's a lot of ways to look at, at plasmonic effects. So in the far field, well, you can take a UV-Vis extinction spectrum, for instance, um, while in, uh, or you can take uh, a single particle uh, scattering spectrum. And the way we do this is using a dark field 
a, a scattering geometry where we illuminate our particles with, um, with a hollow comb, high angle light and collect only the scattered light by the particles. And it gives us these kind of data, okay? So on the left here is extinction spectra for, for different uh, types of particle. Here, the, the composition and the shape is what, is what shifts the spectrum. Uh, or we can look at single particle and correlate that, say, with a, with a TEM image. I've done lots of that uh, sort of a decade ago now, uh, basically looking at, at, at the size and the shape dependence of, um, of the plasmonic response. Um, that's in the far field. Now, the near field is a bit harder to, um, to look at because optically we can't access it because it is smaller than the wavelength of light. Uh, oh, I'm going to skip that for, for a second here. Sorry about that. Lots of animation here. This is, a, really? Okay. Um, all right, so, so in the near field, uh, things, things are a bit smaller, uh, a, bit, a bit more difficult. And, and so how we're going to do this in the near field is that we're going to use um, electron energy loss spectroscopy. And, and, and we're going to send in an electron. And, and, and that electron acts as a point electric charge. And it carries an electromagnetic field. Remember a couple of slides ago, I said, well, if that particle sees an electric field, the electrons will displace. Well, this is what's happening. This electron in your, in your transmission electron microscope is carrying an electromagnetic field, which will induce a polarization in the nanoparticle. And then that polarization generates an induced field here that I have in, in red, and that induced field in turn acts back on the electron that's traveling down the column and can do work uh, against this electron. All of this process, again, really only depends on the plasmonic properties of the nanoparticle. And so by, by having electrons travel around the particle, we're able to sense basically the polarizability or the energy, the polarizability at a certain energy uh, for, um, for these particles. A little bit of math here doesn't really matter. If you want to know more about that, I have a pretty handy uh, handout that I prepared for a conference uh, a bit earlier uh, this year. Um, okay, so what we're going to do here to, to look at the near field is then take an electron beam and actually scan it everywhere around our particle. And, and at the end of the day, what we want is a map of the modes of the particle. What, at what energy is there high electric field? Where is this high electric field? So we're gonna create a spectrum image like I'm showing here, where we have the two spatial dimension and then an energy dimension. And we're somehow gonna extract maps um, um, out of that. This is really a powerful technique uh, because we can really map with nanometer precision the excitation across the IR the visible, the UV, and, and even beyond. Obviously, for plasmonics, we're mostly interested in, uh, in the visible. The only caveat is that, well, these instruments cost a lot more money than the UV vis. Um, and, and they even, they need all the bells and whistles, let's just say, uh, because we really need to monochromate our electrons uh, to have a very, very narrow electron beam with a low background in the visible and the IR range in order to be able to see uh, these, these plasmon resonances. Uh, nevertheless, we've been able to do a lot of that. Um, when I was at Rice, we bought one of these microscopes. Uh, we have a wonderful instrument here in Cambridge as well. And I've been able to collaborate uh, with Quentin at SuperSTEM. Uh, who have an even, even better uh, instruments with, with energy resolution of the order of 10 MeV. So we've been doing a lot of these maps and um, you might notice that my favorite um, color map is JET in MATLAB. Um, and, 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 and we've been going on, on um, about that. And, and what I wanna sort of talk about today is, is something we were able to look at uh, using EELS and using a number of other characterization techniques. And this is um, the idea of magnesium nanoparticles. I'm going to um, say a little bit about the shapes of these particles. They are really unique. Um, I'm going to talk about the plasmonic properties. A lot of EELS maps are going to come back 
Um, we're also going to see quite a bit of, um, oh, Jean-François? Uh, there's yeah. just a quick question because it's related to what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. It says that it, it is difficult to probe isolated nanoparticles. It seems that they, we always see the effect of the substrate. Do you see effect of the substrate in your uh, in your uh, images? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, so the substrate is is unavoidable. Um, in um, when we do eels maps. Uh, we use a silicon nitride substrate. There are effects of the substrate. So for instance, in the cube, uh, you, get, you get a proximal and the distal peak um, and, and so on. In the hexagonal plates that we see uh, in magnesium, there is a bit less effect of the substrate and it's just because the electric field don't penetrate in the substrate much. Um, there's not much we can do to cancel out um, the, the, the substrate in, a, in effect. But um, how we approach that is that we then go ahead and do our numerics by integrating a substrate as well. And so we can, we can really get a, a good correspondence between our, our numerical calculation and our, and our experiments. It, it costs more in numerics. It's a bit more difficult to do, um, but, but it's possible to get a match. Does that, does that answer um, the question? Yeah, I think so. I think it uh, addresses a question. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, any follow up, uh, just post it in in the chat. I'll be happy to to continue talking about substrate effects. Um, right. Uh, so so yeah, shape plasmonics uh, decorations. Really, what I'm going to cover today. Uh, lots of paper on that. All very recent. Um, if you want to 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 read more about this, I, I've written a, a feature article in GFIS can see that that really sort of summarizes the groups. The group's thinking about, uh, about the current and future uh, field in magnesium. The reason we use magnesium is, well, because it's abundant, okay? Um, you know, I spent a lot of my grant money uh, buying gold, and I think, you know, you'll all agree, it's expensive. Um, magnesium is about 2.4% of Earth's crust. It's also biocompatible as a metal and as an oxide, and it forms 0.05% of the body. It is a necessary nutrient. Um, so, so, so it seems uh, like if we could do something plasmonic with magnesium, um, it, it could be a, a, great, um, a, a great alternative to the more expensive um, silver and gold. Uh, it also has a good dielectric function. Okay, so, so when you ask yourself, what's plasmonic? What, you, what you're asking is, well, can you have this resonance and can this resonance go on without too many losses? And what you want for that is basically a small positive imaginary part of dielectric function and a large negative real. The, the imaginary part is really your losses, okay? And, and you can see here that I have the, the imaginary part and I'm gonna kind of zoom in on, on this region. That's basically the UV visible and sort of near IR. And, and you have our usual suspects here, right? Uh, copper um, is here, gold, nearly the same thing as copper, and then, and then silver, very, very low losses in silver. And then, and then here's my magnesium, quite low losses uh, across the UV invisible, increasing losses in the IR. And here's uh, aluminum, very high losses at around 800 because of an interbend transition where basically if you excited the plasmon, it would immediately decay into this center bend transition. So, so it's very lossy. Um, a lot of people are trying to find ways to, to quantify the goodness of a plasmonic. And, and one of the parameters that I like is, um, is this quality factor. And the quality factor is just basically the ratio of the, the real to imaginary parts. So it tells you again, you want a small uh, uh, imaginary part. Uh, and I've plotted this here as a log um, uh, of that quality factor. And, and what I've done here is that, that I'm showing you where the visible uh, range is and where the sunlight shines. If we want to do anything with energy, we're going to want to have it matched with sunlight. And uh, well, you can see that silver is really good. Okay, um, the problem with silver, again, uh, it is uh, quite rare. And, and it oxidizes um, uh, very readily and it oxidizes true uh, without forming a protective oxide. Magnesium is essentially next in line, right? Very good performance in the blue uh, and the, the purple and the green. Uh, and you can see that magnesium basically beats the other abundant element 
uh, across the entire visible range. So, so, so that's why we really started to look at magnesium because it's an excellent candidate uh, for sunlight matched plasmonics. We're not the only one that have been working on magnesium. This is, this is relatively new and, 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 and growing as a field. Um, but, but most of the effort um, until about 2018 has really been in sort of fabricated uh, uh, structure. So here we see, for example, pucks that have been uh, fabricated with, with whole mass colloidal uh, lithography. And these pucks were used to move from, from magnesium to magnesium hydride. What's great here is that magnesium is plasmonic, magnesium hydride is not. So there's a huge shift in the optical um, spectrum. It can also make um, uh, small, um, uh, small squares and of, of the magnesium and their distance and their size actually will dictate the, the, the color of, of this fabricated uh, area. Um, it's also been touted as a transient plasmonic, which can be easily dissolved in water for secret messages between spies or, or something like that. Um, uh, but, but so there, 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 there has been quite a bit of interest in, in magnesium, but again, these are fabricated structures. Um, if you work a little bit in plasmonic, you know that when you fabricate things, um, the quality of the material tends to be lower. They have rough surfaces, they have grain boundaries, and that all leads to um, a low, uh, well, higher losses, essentially, in the, in the plasmonic resonances. So we're interested in making uh, colloidal structures, single crystal nice um, uh, structures. And, and what we did is that we turned to, um, uh, to the literature of, of um, hydrogen storage. And these people had figured out how to make magnesium nanoparticles. It's not that hard. Um, basically, you need to find something that really wants to get rid of an electron. So a lithium naphthanolide, for instance, uh, will give an electron to a, a magnesium organometallic precursor. Well, in fact, will give two electrons and, and, and form a magnesium zero, a metal that will then form a nanoparticle that will grow um, into some uh, uh, shape. And, and these particles are, are nice and sharp and faceted like you would expect um, for gold or silver that's been colloidally produced, but they are not like gold and silver because they do not have the same crystal structure. Magnesium is hexagonal close packed. Gold, silver, copper, aluminum are all face centered cubic. That means that they have different crystallographic facets that are low energy and that in turn means that they basically have different shapes, thermodynamically stable shapes. And in magnesium, the most thermodynamically stable facet is the basal plane 0001. You might notice an extra index here uh, because we are in the hexagonal uh, system. The, the third index is actually redundant with the first two, but, but, but that's, the, that's the notation, all right? Um, and then there are a number of other not quite densely packed, but, um, but, but quite packed. Uh, so the 0001 is close packed. The other ones are, are, are well, let's say that's a fact, um, uh, uh, surfaces of relatively low energy that can act as twin boundaries. Um, and, and, and I have them here. There's a, there's a series of the one zero one bar and then X, and that X can be one or two or three and, and, and so on. Um, and we noticed initially that the structure made, um, I'll come back to that in a second, um, that the structure made these, these, these single crystal nanoplates. And the first paper we published, we're like, oh yeah, they all make, they all make hexagonal nanoplates. Well, yeah. Turns out when we looked more closely, um, only about half of the particles were nanoplates. And the other things we had were uh, folded plates that were folded along one of the twin boundaries that I just showed. And, and that fold angle, of course, is dependent on the crystallographic orientation of that boundary. And, and so we started looking at those and, and, and we decided to have a magnesium picnic, okay? So we have a tents, we have chairs, we have tacos, and we have kites. And, and we see um, these structures um, in, in different, um, um, in different percentages I'll show in a minute. Uh, we can actually uh, use our software Crystal Creator 
to, um, to model these shapes. So this is basically a, a, a graphical user interface. It's free on the web if you're interested. Uh, it basically does wolf shapes plus a twin boundary. So we coded these different twin boundary, did a, did a bit of trial and error to find which ones were actually seeing, measured our experimental particle, measured the, um, uh, the numerics. And, and actually found uh, found these these twin boundaries. We then we then got uh, electron diffraction data to confirm that. And they are actually in occurrence that uh, map with the energy of the twin boundary. Uh, so most of the particles do not have any twins. After that, the most um, the most prevalent particle are the tens because the one zero one bar one twin is the lowest energy twin, and so on for the chairs and tacos and kites. And then we see these elongated um, uh, particles, which we understand only halfway. Uh, we're still sort of working on that. I have a little bit of yields results on that uh, a bit later. Um, it's magnesium, it oxidizes. But the oxide layer is actually that. It's a layer that is self-limiting and we can uh, zoom in on that layer with our electron microscope and, and, and see that indeed this is, this is an oxide layer, this is magnesium metal and this oxide is anywhere from a few nanometer to, to about 15, uh, 20 nanometer depending on, on the particle. We can map this oxide spectroscopically as well, not just image it. Uh, so this is energy dispersive uh, X-ray spectroscopy maps, for instance, of, of various types of particles. So this is a tent here, and, and then we have the hexagonal plates. We've even cut a little slice of, of these hexagon here, and then we're looking at this perpendicular uh, uh, in order to map the, the oxide layer around here. And, and all of our measurements are, are really quite heterogeneous, but, but the oxides, you know, it's about 10 nanometers, sometimes more, sometimes uh, a bit less, um, but, but the particles are never fully oxidized. So, so they remain plasmonic and, and they, um, they remain plasmonic even in air, they remain metallic even in air. Uh, this is magnesium um, nanoparticle powder um, that still show a uh, signature of magnesium metal by X-ray diffraction after even two weeks uh, in air. That was done in Houston, with, so pretty, pretty humid air. Um, so, so I want to switch gears now. We talked about uh, a little bit about shapes. I want to tell you uh, about their plasmonic property because this is, uh, after all, really what motivated us uh, to, look, to look at these particles. And so we're going to do some eels here. Okay, and what we're going to do is that we're going to send our electron beam, as I explained uh, earlier, in various areas around the particle. So if I send my electron beam uh, away from the particle, it's the gray line, and it's, it's basically just uh, the tail of the zero loss peak, and, and then absolutely nothing. If I, if I put my beam inside the particle, I see this giant peak at about 11 eV that is not a localized surface plasmon resonance. In fact, it's a bulk plasmon. So the condensed matter physicists here know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it really is just a, a signature of the, of the metallic nature of that uh, magnesium. And that's super useful uh, because it gives us a map, uh, an accurate map of where the metal is. Uh, this is not a property uh, that we easily can, can probe um, in, in silver or gold or even in copper. It's really, really useful uh, in magnesium and in fact in aluminum as well. All right, but if we go back to localized surface plasma and resonance, if we look at the other, uh, the other positions, okay, uh, up here, uh, and, and we sort of zoom in, we start to see various kind of peaks appear depending on where we put um, our beam. Of course, we don't uh, just do six measurements. We're actually gonna do a map through the entire particle and extract from that where is the intensity of, say, the peak here at, at, at 1.3 EV uh, and so on. And so here's an example of, um, of another single, um, uh, single particle measurement. So this is very, the very, very first measurements we did on these. This is a hexagon. And you see that it has a number uh, uh, of peaks of, of various, um, uh, of various uh, energy. Um, we can map this to our numeric, numerical result. It only works if we get 
all of the parameters and the numerics right. We must put an oxide on the surface of the particle because that shifts the energy of the plasma on resonance. We must put a substrate because that also uh, uh, shifts uh, the energy. But once we do that, we get a really pretty good match with, with our experiment. And you'll see in a minute that that's, that's really key to understanding what's going on in these particles. All right, so we, we, we get this map we extract basically the, um, the probability of excitation at, at specific energies. And, um, and we get these kind of things, okay? So, so here's the particle, what it looks like. Here's where the magnesium metal is, okay? It looks roughly hexagonal. And, and there you have sort of three modes. And, and the first mode looks kind of like a donut. Uh, the second mode looks like it has field intensity or loss probability rather at the tips of the particle. And then the turn mode look like maybe field intensity at the, at the edge and the center of the particle. And, you know, if, you, if you're an experimentalist like me, you, you, you just sort of end there and, and you call this mode the donut mode for the rest of your life without really understanding. Um, but thankfully, I have wonderful collaborators here in Cambridge, and, and, and John is one of them, John Biggins. And he, he's been able to do a numerical calculations on this to, to help my group understand what actually is the excitation that, that, that we're probing. Um, so the first thing he does is, is to simulate the eel's response and to make sure that, that we're, uh, we're thinking the, the, the same thing. And so indeed, the, the, the simulated eels match really well, uh, both in distribution and in energy. And then we can look at basically the field distribution, the, the sort of the blue and red, as we call it, this is basically positive and negative, if you want. Um, and, and what we can see is that, of course, the first excitation uh, in these particles is a dipole. Uh, and it looks like a donut indeed, because anywhere you go around, you're, you are going to excite the dipole. The second uh, modes we see though is, is different um, and it's not a single mode. It is two modes that are not, not exactly degenerate, but they have very similar energy. So they're, they're excited at the same time. And this is basically the combination of a quadrupole here and, and a tip hexapole. Our next mode is in fact an uh, edge hexapole, which is not degenerate with the tip hexapole and, and a radial greeting mode. And these are the patterns um, uh, they form so we're able to look at that on, on many, many particles. Here's nine of these particles. They always have the same modes. The modes are not necessarily at the same energies because of course size matters, uh, but in terms of, of, of mode distribution, and uh, this is very repeatable. We've then started looking at our tens, our elongated particle. Remember, these are basically hexagons that are folded and have elongated a little bit. And, and so that should break the symmetry. Right? It turns out that your dipole now um, it is, is non-degenerate. So there's going to be a longitudinal dipole and a transverse dipole. And I'm going to use this, uh, this notation LW saying, for instance, here there is one node along the length and zero node along the width. So this would be my one zero mode and, and so on. This would be the, the zero one mode and then the quadruples one one and so on and so forth. And we've been able to map those um, both in numerics and, and in experiment and sort of understand how do the mode um, behave when we are elongating these particles. And here's even, so this is the same particles I showed already on top. Uh, and in the bottom, we're seeing basically a red shift of, um, of, of the modes as the particle um, elongate. Uh, and, and a bit of, 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 of change between the orders of the mode. And, and in fact, uh, we see this over and over. Okay, we've done all sorts of, of measurements, but, but, but the theory is real simple. Uh, and, and the theory basically tells us that, that our energy is proportional to, um, to the number of, uh, of nodes for say the width over uh, the width and the number of nodes over the, um, uh, the light, over the light and you, you can plot that. Uh, and, and basically it just tells you that, well, the, the longitudinal dipole is just gonna redshift as a big L becomes longer and, uh, and the transverse dipole is essentially constant because here we fix the, the width uh, constant and then the quadrupole will eventually be higher energy than um, then the L equals two um, uh, uh, mode and so on and so forth. So, so the order of, of, these, of these modes actually change as the particle shape uh, uh, changes. 
And, and as the particle shape elongates more and more, uh, what you get is exactly what you would expect for, for rods, uh, where all of the transverse components are now essentially suppressed. And you're only getting longitudinal components and, and really quite high order of these longitudinal components. So here's an example of a, of a rod on the right here with an aspect ratio of eight. And, and we can see a, a L equals one, L equals two, L equals three, L equals four mode and so on. Um, it's kind of reassuring to see that uh, because this is what people have seen for decades in gold and silver. So, so magnesium might be a new material, but fundamentally it has, uh, it has the same behavior as any uh, plasmonic uh, structure. And one of the hallmarks of plasmonic structure is size effects, right? So, so shape effects as I've shown, but also size effects. So as particles become bigger and bigger, the plasmons, uh, redshift. So, uh, so this, is, this is a busy slide, sorry about that. Uh, but just, just focus on, on, on this um, bottom uh, a plot where I'm basically looking at the hexagon size and the plasmon energy for these three modes that we've, uh, we've studied a, a little bit earlier. And, and that tells you that, yeah, the, the plasmon can be shifted um, um, with size, but the plasmon also of a heterogeneous mixture would then uh, be from about 1.4 all the way to 3.6 EV. So we're really spanning the UV visible and near IR uh, with these structures. They're very well mapped uh, to the, the solar spectrum. All right, so I've said a few words about plasmonics. Um, I hope that, that you're convinced that, that magnesium actually holds its metallic character despite the oxide layer and indeed acts as a, as a plasmonic antenna, just like silver, uh, gold, copper, and, and aluminum would do. Um, and what I want to uh, say in the, in, in the little bit of time I have left is that we can do even more with that, right? That we're going to be able, hopefully, <laughs> uh, to, do, um, uh, to do functionalization uh, in order to do catalysis, to do plasmon enhanced catalysis. And, and, and so what we want to do is, is use our magnesium metal as a scaffold for catalytic metals. We want to decorate it somehow. Um, if we're going to do any chemistry with magnesium, though, again, it's always harder uh, because it reacts so violently with water. Uh, so we're going to need a non aqueous solvent. And, and, and at the very beginning of that, uh, in my group, we're asking ourselves, well, can, can we even do uh, this kind of decoration with the non aqueous solvent. And so we use silver and gold as a bit of a proof of concept to do galvanic replacement. Uh, and, and we've done galvanic replacement in methanol, in ethanol, in isopropanol, and, and, and sort of prove to ourselves that it works um, before we, uh, we move to, um, uh, to magnesium. Uh, and, and so, okay, well, fair enough. Uh, it, it works with a, a non aqueous solvent. Um, we then have to think if we're going to do galvanic replacement, we really have a problem because there's a, there's a huge barrier. There's a magnesium oxide barrier that, that might actually prevent a, a, a reaction. And this is what we've seen with aluminum. We've, we've, we've systematically been incapable of galvanically replacing aluminum, try all sorts of ways. And, and, and it seems that the oxide really is a barrier. Um, you can imagine that in magnesium it's not, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about that. Um, another issue is, is that there's, gonna, there's always a large lattice parameter mismatch and, and often a different crystal structure between magnesium and the metals that we're trying to, um, uh, to replace with. It's not clear whether we're going to get alloying. Um, magnesium and, and, and silver do alloy, um, but, but the other metals is, is not as, um, as likely. But, but the saving grace here is that magnesium is really reactive. And, and, and so there's a huge thermodynamic driving force uh, to overcome uh, this, this, this oxide layer and, and to drive a galvanic replacement. And it works, OK? So we're going to be taking our particles. We're going to do this in ethanol, room temperature, just a pinch of, of another metal, say, say, say a gold salt. And, and what we're going to end up with is um, gold metal, a little bit of magnesium uh, ion, so magnesium two plus, and 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 if we control the stoichiometry right, there should be a little bit of magnesium metal uh, left.
to do um, uh, its plasmonics. And, and this is an example uh, for gold. Okay, so if we don't put any gold, we get our gray, gray green solution of, of magnesium. As we add more gold, the plasmon resonance of these gold particles uh, starts, starts to pop. If we put too much gold, well, everything crashes down in, in, in aggregates. And, and, the, and the, the sweet spot, the full replacement actually is at, at a two to three. So it's just here at 0.6. Um, but if we do uh, less than that, then we still have uh, magnesium present as metal. Um, so, so this works. Um, you know, the more gold we put, the, the, the more uh, gold particles we get. Uh, on, and these are decorated on the structures. We don't find gold floating around alone. There's nothing to reduce it in the, in the, in, in the flask. Uh, there's only the magnesium uh, as the source of, of electrons. Um, so again, the more gold, the, the more stoichiometry of gold, the more um, gold uh, on, on, on the structures. And here's a, um, a tilt series, for instance. And, and this is to show how difficult it is to characterize these particles uh, because there is a, a nanoplate of magnesium in here, uh, but there's also the small particles of gold. And the reason why you don't see the magnesium is because of the contrast difference in high angle annular dark field, where you have a Z to the 1.7 uh, uh, scattering probability and the gold scatters so much more than the magnesium that that essentially the the, the magnesium is, is is completely shadowed uh, by this gold so it makes some characterization really quite uh, tricky sometimes uh, but 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 we manage and one of the way we manage is by using a bright field uh, stem where where the magnesium here has um, more interaction uh, with the beam, we're able to look at the oxide layer, for instance. And, and funny enough, um, the oxide layer appears to reform uh, between the gold particle and, and the magnesium um, uh, metallic uh, uh, core. We don't yet fully understand the mechanism of, of this galvanic replacement um, because of, uh, due to that oxide uh, layer, but we're, we are working on that and it's very exciting. Um, they are gold, okay, uh, we can do all sorts of, of experiments such as energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. Um, uh, some of the magnesium, of course, uh, gets etched and turned into magnesium oxide. Some of the magnesium uh, uh, remains as, um, as metal in here. Uh, we can track this. Uh, Jeremy has done really beautiful work uh, on that. This is, uh, for instance, the reaction kinetics uh, with gold. And this is really quite easy um, because, uh, because your gold salt has a big whoopy absorption here, uh, uh, just, just, um, uh, just higher than 300 uh, nanometer. And then the gold particles start to absorb here at about uh, 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 550. So by looking at the ratio, we can look at, at, at the rate of consumption of the gold ions and them turning into uh, uh, gold uh, particles. And, and, and the reaction is relatively slow. Um, despite this amazing driving force, right, it still takes us about three hours to, to reach um, our final product. And again, this is most likely due to the presence of that oxide that creates a big barrier. Once, once the oxide is pitted a bit, the reaction goes, but it takes time uh, to get there. We've been able to do this with any metal you can name. Essentially, um, it's, it, it, it's just so easy indeed, because uh, there's such a, a driving force. So here's an example um, for silver. Again, just the silver plasmon resonance that comes uh, uh, through uh, more silver, more silver particles, as, as you can expect. Here's another one of these, uh, of these still series. Again, really hard to see where the magnesium particles are, but here there are two hexagons sort of next to each other. Uh, decorated with, with um, these silver particles. I'm sure someone's going to ask the question, how, 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 how controllable is this? Um, and, and in terms of, of the, the, both the position and the size of the decorating metals, um, we have no control so far, to be honest. Um, what we can control is um, essentially the density uh, of these particles, but, but we are working um, on this, uh, on trying to control um, the size uh, of, the, of the deposits. Um, same thing, right? We can track 
um, and this time is with stoichiometry. We can track the optical properties, and this is for for silver. You would get a full replacement at, at at two to one or at two equivalent. And and indeed, in the extinction spectrum, this is when the silver plasma is the highest. If you overdo it, then then everything coming kind of crashes out of solution. So at three equivalent, everything is replaced, and and there's a huge broadening because of this uh, of this aggravation. We can do this with more, um, um, more catalytically relevant metals. So this is an example of, uh, of palladium uh, uh, that we've been able to decorate. And we do retain the plasmonic properties of the, of the magnesium and add the catalytic surface of, of palladium. And, and I just hired a, a new postdoc from Oxford and uh, he's, he's there to do um, uh, a lot of, of catalysis, uh, both liquid phase and gas phase catalysis and photocatalysis on these. Uh, so this is really uh, an exciting development. And, and we can do, again, any metal, right? We had some iron salts, we threw it in there, it works. I'm not sure we're gonna do anything with this iron, but, but, it, but it does work, okay? Um, we really believe it's a galvanic replacement uh, mechanism. And, and when our paper um, gets, got, got reviewed, there was a lot of questions about that. And, and that's fair because there is a big magnesium oxide layer. But, but, but here's the deal. We, we really think it's, it's, it's galvanic replacement um, because we see a lot of etching out and, and a lot of inhomogeneous etching out of the magnesium where there is, say, a gold particle. Uh, we also have no other reducing agent in solution. This is ethanol at room temperature. It will not reduce a gold salt or a silver salt by itself. If we don't put a metal salt and we just put our particles in ethanol, well, nothing happens. They are stable for years in that. Um, there's, a, again, a huge thermodynamic driving force uh, in the reduction potential. It works with essentially um, um, well, not, not all metal, but most metals. Um, and, and we can then uh, also track the magnesium movement to the supernatant so we can actually uh, look at, at the magnesium ions. And indeed, as we change the stoichiometry of the reaction, we're basically leaking out magnesium ion into the supernatant. So we're, we're, we're quite confident this is a galvanic replacement uh, mechanism. We published this uh, just, just last year. Um, I think that's it uh, uh, for today. Uh, I hope I convinced you that, that magnesium is really exciting. It's unique in its way. It produces different shapes. D shape gave, gives it plasmonic properties that are as good as silver and gold. In, well, no, uh, nearly as good as silver, but definitely as good as gold and, and, and copper in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that these properties are manipulated by the size and the shape of these particles. And we're now able to harness the plasmonic properties of these structure by decorating its surface uh, with, with essentially an arbitrary composition, uh, as long as it's a metal um, that, that has a thermodynamic driving force towards this galvanic replacement. And, and, and really at the end of the day, right, the big picture of this is that if we manage to take something that's free and abundant, like sunlight, drive a chemical reaction with an antenna that is really cheap and again, really abundant, turn that sunlight into a chemical energy, well, we can turn something, a molecule, a carbon-based molecule that, it, that is cheap and abundant into something that, that's really um, valuable. And, and, and I think magnesium is an opportunity to do that. There's a lot of challenges ahead. We're just scratching the surface of its chemistry and have to understanding its chemical properties and its plasmonic properties. Um, but, but, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of excitement uh, on this, um, uh, at least in, in England and definitely in my group. And again, I wanna thank the, the people who, um, who've done all the work. Uh, again, Jeremy, Christina, Elizabeth, and, and my collaborators. And, and thanks for, um, for tuning in this morning and taking the time uh, to learn something new uh, or something different. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Amini.